The story of Scalextric actually started earlier than 1957 with the formation of Mini Models. A small toy company based in Mill Hill, northwest London, introduced a range of tin toy cars. These models featured an innovative clockwork mechanism, which was activated by pressing the car downwards and back. A third driving wheel fitted beneath the chassis wound a clockwork mechanism causing the car to accelerate away on almost any surface. So how did the scale car project get underway? Well, I had always wanted to be in, in, uh, in toy manufacturing, uh, so that having established a small tool making company, which gave me the wherewithal for manufacturing the tools for manufacturing toys, I set up as, uh, the company of mini models in 1947 and started trading in 1948 with the introduction of the mini type typewriter, a toy typewriter. It sold a few, but just about covered its costs, made a small profit. How many Scalex models were there? Altogether eight. The first one I, I know was the Jaguar XK120, you've already seen. The next one was the Aston Martin DB2. Following that was the MGTF. And there was something really special about the MGTF. Well, the MGTF couldn't be produced by our, with our normal uh, presswork methods in tin plate. We had to use aluminium. How did the StarTex project begin? We needed a different mechanism, we needed a different range as well to complement the Scalex range. They made the Scalex Mark II uh, and then they went on to make the StarTex Mark II which had a very unusual way of winding the mechanism. You actually pulled a, a little, little knob on the end of the exhaust pipe right. which wound the engine up and they went along that way. The same model was then put, the same mechanism was then put into the Austin Healy which was actually a Scalex model, but with the addition of a windscreen and a driver and a little bit of tarting up of the side, that was introduced as well as a StarTex model, again by pulling out the, uh, the little button of the, underneath the back bump. In terms of manufacturing, how many models were made? In total, probably no more than one and a half million, I think, probably five or six hundred thousand of each model. Right not so successful as the Scalex. The early toys were stunningly attractive, representing sports and racing cars of the era. Introduced in 1952, they proved commercially profitable for the next four years. Fred Francis was always keen to develop the product further, so a visit to a London exhibition brought about a change in format. A track-based racing system was devised, enabling electrically motivated cars to circulate. When did you realise a track system was the way forward? I think probably in 1950 when I had an idea for embedding a metal strip in a cardboard base which could guide clockwork cars around a roadway system. The difficulty I found then was that there was practically no play, play value. Once you wound them up, the car would run around until the clockwork had run down, and there was no way in which you could guide it and do very much with it. So although I put in a patent application for it, I actually abandoned the idea as thinking that it didn't have very much play value. Later on, uh, I would go to, when I went to the Royal Horticultural Hall to model engineers exhibition, I saw cars which were driven by petrol motors going around a plywood or hardboard track guided by slots in the track. The cars could be raced but they couldn't be controlled. It required some form of control of the operator's hands to make it into a, a, a play thing or a com competitive game so that you could actually race the cars which you couldn't actually do with the petrol driven ones. Did you incur any technical problems when first establishing the track system? No, the whole, whole, all of that went very easily. There was really no problem at all. The, the initial track was made from perspex with um, metal rail embedded into it for guiding the cars and driving the, the cars around. In the first place, I thought perhaps I would make it from metal 
and uh, the, the, because it would have suited our production much better, since we had a very good setup for actual press work. But then I decided that it didn't have appeal, it couldn't be uh, flexed so as to bank it, it would not be very attractive, and uh, it wouldn't look like a roadway. Even if we were to print or do something with it, it still wouldn't look like a roadway, it would look like a metal trap. So for that reason I went for plastic. But since plastic moulding in those days was relatively in its infancy, where large mouldings were concerned, I had to find an alternative material. And the alternative was, was rubber, because I could use a very cheap, get a, have a firm, mould the track for me, using a very cheap mix, which would be comparable in price, or better in price than the, the plastic alternative. The moulds were comparatively cheap to make, easy to make, and therefore they could, we could get into production quickly, which we couldn't do with, with injection moulding. Have you any idea what the early development costs were? Oh, they were very low, very low. I would, um, I couldn't even begin to guess really, but they couldn't have been more than, at that time, a few thousand pounds, maybe two or three thousand pounds. A rubber-based track system incorporated two parallel grooves. The grooves had metal rails fitted, within which a gimbal wheel fitted to the base of the car would sit. Passing an electrical current through the tracks powered the cars, and Scalex Electric, or Scalextric, was formed. The name is nowadays applied to all aspects of slot car racing, such is the strong appeal. This was the first of the Scalextric range, the Ferrari. Uh, the um, pickup system was different on this from the modern day, in that it had a, a gimbal wheel which picked up the current and guided the car. Uh, you probably wondered why one of the back wheels is hard plastic and the other one is soft rubber. Had a very simple reason. We wanted the car to go out of control on the bends, and this was a sure way of making certain that that happened. Otherwise, uh, it was really a modified Scalex car, and uh, a very good replica we thought of that day. In front of the gimbaled wheel, there appears to be a rosette that is actually a lead weight which was put there to hold the car down on the track to give pickup facility. It came from the ballast of my boat which was surface to requirements. The toy trade fair at Harrogate gave Scalextric its first airing outside the factory. Toy dealers placed substantial orders, far in excess of Mini Model's production capacity. Remarkable since production wasn't scheduled to begin until five months later. So what happened by 1958? Well, by mid-1958, production and demand for scale extra had become well beyond the capacity of the existing factory to cope with. Uh, our production uh, had more than doubled, the output had more than doubled since the previous best year of 1955, when we turned over 88,000 the production meant that we were now running at a turnover well in excess of 200,000. And with the demand and the need to widen the range of products, it would have meant expanding the factory so many times that we would actually have had to move to a new site. I didn't feel very happy about doing that because we only had the Scalex scale extra range as our only product. The toy trade is terribly volatile, and although I thought that scale extra had a very good future, I couldn't be sure that it was going to have a, a, a steady continuing future, and having no other product would have meant that if it had collapsed, then we would have been left with a factory instead of employing only 100 people, maybe employing 1,000 with all the resultant overheads and, and capital out there. So I didn't feel that it was a risk worth taking. So it happened by November 1958, Fred Francis had put mini models on the market. 
The firm was sold to the Lines Brothers Triang Group. Richard Lines, now of Hornby Hobbies, tells the tale of developments at the time. Yes, Triang was a very progressive company and we made a great point of visiting toy fairs, exhibitions, to see what sort of toys were appearing, uh, quite apart from our own developments. And we noticed this uh, model car racing game called Scalextric uh, during 1957, uh, when it first came out, and uh, felt that it had a lot of potential. Um, I don't recall the exact means whereby we got in contact with Fred Francis, but uh, we were able to do a, a deal with him in November 1958, as we felt that with our experience and uh, background, we could develop it very extensively uh, as a worldwide selling toy. What developments were Triang able to instigate? Well, when you inherit a, <coughs> a product uh, like that, you, you look at it very closely to see whether it's fundamentally sound. Um, we did find things about it which we weren't very happy with. I think the probably the worst feature was the, the way you controlled the vehicles. You had this um, rather crude little dabber device which made the cars go in jerks. And we, we felt very much that it needed a proper controller so that you could control it at all speeds. Uh, secondly, we were concerned at the actual vehicles because the process of pressing them out of metal was quite complicated and, and uh, required a lot of skill. And it also required very special material because if you're trying to deep draw steel, you have to use exactly the right type of material, otherwise it splits. And in those days, it wasn't easy to obtain the sort of quality of material that was necessary. So putting these two together, we, we developed very quickly a proper hand throttle with uh, fully variable control. And we also set to work to design cars which had plastic bodies, uh, which certainly needed a high investment for the original tooling, but that they were very easy to make thereafter. It took Triang a little over a year before they were in the position to introduce new models. They already had their famous RX electric motor, and their attitude towards accurate scale reproduction, allied to well-tried plastic moulding techniques, would set a standard for many years to come. And this is what the model lineup looked like in 1960, complete with just some of the colour combinations. Based in Havant, Hampshire, Triang were able to use the nearby Goodwood racing circuit as an ideal model for their planned layouts. Bringing a sense of scale reality was the criterion. In fact, many of the buildings were based on those at Goodwood. Even today, the circuit remains little altered from those halcyon days of the early 1960s. Triang's wide range of track sections enabled replica circuits to be built in spare rooms and bedrooms around the world and the infamous Goodwood chicane became an integral component of any scale trick layout. Sales were progressing to outstanding levels. By 1960, the company was turning over £538,000. Many retailers set up demonstration tracks so that children and their parents could experience the thrills and spills of scale model racing. At last, there was a viable, if expensive, alternative to the traditional train set. The Full Flood Road Factory at Lee Park was moving production and quality standards up in preparation for an assault on the export scene. Four new cars were launched for the 1961 season. The Cooper, BRM, Jaguar D-Type and Porsche Spider took to the tracks. Again, the cars were available in a wide range of colours. Catalogue number two introduced a greater range of accessories. They included bridges, bankings and numerous buildings which gave a boost to a growing band of enthusiasts. Changes were made to the braids and pickup points which gave improved performance. By this stage, the annual sales turnover saw £690,000 worth being sold to the UK, with exports accounting for a further quarter of a million pounds worth of stock. With success on the international front, a new factory had to be built close to the existing site. 
A commercial decision was reached to reduce prices as a result of increases in production to meet the volume demand. Uh, when we were able to reduce prices um, later on, I think probably from about 1961, because by that time we, we had become a, quite a, a solid company and were able to foresee the possible volume of business that we were going to achieve. And of course when you have this information you can, you can predict costs much more clearly. Uh, I think there were two other main factors. One was that the original plastic cars made in the original factory, uh, the, the factory had no plastic molding machines, so we actually had to buy the car bodies from another company, uh, it was another trying company, and similarly the electric motors were also bought in so that the Mini Models factory was really just assembling. Uh, once we realized that the, the volume that were going to be achieved, we introduced our own plastic molding machines, which obviously meant that we weren't paying for other people's profits. And similarly, we made our own electric motors. And with the added efficiency of all this, it meant that the costs came down and we were able to pass this on to the public. Uh, I think the uh, original price of the cars was 32 and six. Uh, and the reduction that we were able to implement brought them down to 29 and 11 which is in a different price band as far as consumer sales are concerned. So it was quite an important move. Further new models were launched, including the nostalgic Le Mans style Bentley and the beautifully styled Alfa Romeo. Sales had increased yet again. Considering that this was 1962, you will appreciate the strength of the market, with the UK alone producing £900,000 worth and exports a further 435,000. Fred Francis' original rubber track was reaching the end of its usable life. In Triang's hands, it was determined that manufacturing of track sections could start in-house, rather than spending inordinate sums of money with contract suppliers. A suitable replacement was required. Well, the change in track production from rubber to plastic uh, was, was done for a number of reasons, but the, the main one was the sheer inconvenience of having to buy such a huge volume of rubber mouldings from an outside supplier, uh, which inevitably meant you weren't as flexible as you would be if you could make your own in your own factory. Um, there was a tremendous amount of road traffic with the rubber mouldings being delivered by lorry, all of which had to be unloaded and the materials stored. Uh, by that time we had our own plastic moulding machines running in the factory and it seemed awfully obvious to us to, to tool up and produce our own. Um, quite apart from the convenience, it was going to save quite a cost as well. Um, there was one other factor and that was that the rubber track didn't hold together as positively as we felt it should. And the new design for plastic, uh, which was of course patented, had some very positive connectors on it. And in fact, these are the ones that are still in use today. So the introduction of what would become known as Plexitrack was supported by some intriguing new model racing cars. By late 1963, there were 18 models in the lineup. Two motorcycle combinations and the go-karts were added to it. Around this same period, the highly desired Bugatti and Auto Union models also made their first appearances. Turnover was now over £1,226,000 in the UK alone. Exports accounted for a further half a million pounds worth of sales. Scalextric had developed to the level where it could now be truly regarded as the most complete motor racing system in the world. Formula Junior was a most popular form of motorsport in the early 1960s. Scalextric's version of the formula was faithful to the original. Not universally liked by Scalextric customers, 
these cars possessed a certain charm in their attempt to emulate the real thing. It should be remembered that the actual racing cars were small, underpowered and suffered from handling which required controlling. The same could be said of the scale extric models. Retailing for a mere 15 shillings 11 or 80 pence, it was not an expensive buy, yet still featured Ackerman type steering geometry. Regarded by international motor race enthusiasts as the finest driver in any class of vehicle, Jim Clark's run of victories no doubt helped to piece together a promotional deal with Skelextric in 1964. Jim Clark represented the aspirations of youngsters from all over the world. Jim was obviously a, a shy character, uh, but an undoubted winner. And it was his winning ability that I think Skelextrics were able to put over into their, into their commercial material. I mean, he was a, a great in, in inspiration to, to local uh, people, including drivers, and to local children. I mean, I, I've met a lot of local children who are now um, rally drivers in, in the area. Jim Clark, by his sheer sta mere standing in the Formula One racing sy system at the time, and his expertise on the track, related back to the slot car racing scene and the toy markets in the, before the 1970s. With the success on the track, which related through to the toys and the variety of cars and equipment available through Scale Electrics, it certainly produced a new thrust and excitement which was much appreciated by the customers, young and old alike. It certainly did help to sell extra scale electrics by the sheer fact that someone of his standing and expertise in a very exciting and skilled activity was committed enough to put his name and his time and experience to promoting that level of interest in the sport. And it is a sport, it's just, not just toys, it's a sport. And the export markets at this time were becoming exceptionally lively. A number of exclusive manufacturing arrangements were established. Richard Lines. Yes, we had to make a lot of special arrangements for export. <clears throat> Ideally, uh, if you've got a worldwide market, it's very, very good because it means the factory can run at a high rate. But we ran into all sorts of problems, um, nothing to do with ourselves, but for example, in Australia at that time, there were restrictions on imports, um, and they, you had to get a license and so on. Uh, similarly in New Zealand and in many other places. And the only way you could provide the right volume of product to the local population was by manufacturing inside. Um, we had an associated company in Australia and it seemed very obvious that we should supply them with some certain duplicate tooling so that they could do the, the, the mass manufacture locally and then we could still use licenses to bring in some of the accessories that were not fundamental to the system. Um, we had the same problem in New Zealand. Uh, later on, we wanted to set up in the common market, and we had already built a factory in France, uh, and it was very convenient to be able to sh sh shuttle molds and tools across the channel. Uh, to the factory in Calais, uh, where we were intending to take um, all our European production from. Um, we had another problem in Spain, because that was a totally closed market in the days of General Franco. And the, some people there uh, grabbed the opportunity to register the name Scalextric uh, before we did. And they were very honourable, and they came to us, and they said that they'd done this, and that they wanted to set up manufacture under licence. And uh, this we were very happy to agree to. Agree to. And, uh, and it was a very satisfactory outcome from this arrangement. The American market was not left unattended. Triang already had a long-established link with Lionel, the US-based model train manufacturers. Another agreement was reached to sell Scale Extric to American motor race fans who'd been weaned on a diet of stadium and oval type racing. A brand new range of models was designed and produced in Hong Kong. By 1965, the technical developments were being introduced fast and furious. Scale Extric's first front wheel driven model was made. The play value of the Mini was immense, and the world's most complete motor racing system was able to compete head-on with other developments in the toy industry. 
Corgi toys and, to a lesser extent, Matchbox, were introducing numerous features to their static models. However, none of them could match the sheer delight attached to playing with Skelextric. Most of these were die-cast metal toys, whereas Skelextric was still investing in plastics and composites. Two innovations around this time were the blowout simulator and twin auto screams. Now, what child could fail to be drawn to the prospect of his own car spinning uncontrollably off the track circuit? Even the child of today takes great delight in creeping downstairs on Christmas morning to play with a toy which can do so much more than just look nice in a box. Only one year later, in 1966, and a further innovation was added to the range, race-tuned cars. Scale extra race tuning cars had a tremendous impact. The changes at the time were way ahead of anything else that the competitors were using. They introduced jet guides uh, instead of pin guides, they changed the tyre compounds, gearing and the engines, they were way ahead of anything else. The variety of cars that Scale were producing at that time related very much to what was seen on the track. So the customers would go to a racing circuit, see the band walls, the Lotus, the Ferraris. They could then go back to the shops, buy them and race the cars, which handled in a very similar way to the real cars of their time, with the drivers that they were, in fact, emulating on their home circuits. Well, the introduction of race-tuned cars, I think it had a lot of sources. I, I, I seem to remember the American scene was one where people said they didn't go fast enough. Uh, but it was a bit of a mixed blessing because the ordinary non-race tuned cars were perfectly capable of spinning off the track if you didn't control them very carefully. So really to introduce a faster motor, which we did by putting different windings on the armature, was not really very beneficial to people actually racing scale extric, but it did, it sounded good and we were able to put little stickers on the cars saying race tuned, and they did go faster. But I think it would be um, only people who had very large layouts with long straights who could really appreciate the benefits that race tuned um, was, was able to give. Uh, a little bit of a gimmick, I think, perhaps would be fair. The sales volume was beginning to level off uh, by 66, and when this happens, you you do have to do something, and uh, it, it seemed that uh, faster cars, uh, suitably labelled, uh, would perhaps encourage people to go out and buy a few more. Um, so it was a, a, an attempt to, to boost the sales. Well, I can't honestly say that it, it had a, that effect. The following year, 1967, was a good one for toy makers around the world. Probably one of the most famous toy introductions during this period was the Corgi Aston Martin, launched to coincide with the success of the James Bond movies. Scalextric responded to the market with their own James Bond race set. Barely 20 years after the toy was first sold, values had increased many times. The Mercedes featured a spring-loaded bumper to turn the car over, whilst the Aston had a working ejector seat mechanism activated against a plastic rock in the centre of the track layout. It also had a bulletproof shield which shot up from the boot lid. The play value was outstanding. Unfortunately, the set was not a great seller. 1967 also saw the launch of a larger 1 24th scale range of Scalextric, aimed specifically at the slot car market. The introduction of 1 24th scale this again, I think, generated from America, where the, at that time they had these thousands of things called slot shops down every high street where you could go in and race. And uh, when one was having a company that was deeply into slot racing, uh, you have to be everywhere. The, the 124th was the most beautiful system. The, the rails were made of stainless steel, and the cars had all sorts of features and details, and they were very beautifully made. Um, but of course, it cost a great deal of money to invest in all these extra tooling. And unfortunately for the company, we were too late. The, there was a craze for this slot shop business in the States had dwindled off 
uh, by the time we were out in the market. So that for all its wonders, 124th was a commercial disaster, and, uh, and the company was only able to carry it on for a couple of years, at which point, sadly, we had to abandon it. But uh, the, the uh, products that survive are highly admired and prized, I understand, by the collectors. A year later, the 124 scale cars were still available, along with other models which were now standardized. Unfortunately, the promotional tie-up with Jim Clark and the Lotus team ceased when he met his untimely death at the Hockenheim circuit during a Formula 2 race on the 7th of April, 1968. Jim Clark's death was a very sad blow to not just us, but a lot of other people, um, of course. Um, I think it would be difficult to, to, to quantify the effect it had on the company. Um, but to go back to him, we originally got together with him because he was manifestly the best at the time and we felt that the association of the best with scale electric was one that was not to be missed as it would have been quite painful if any other competitor had uh, enlisted his aid um, he was a splendid fellow and uh, we were able to use his uh, head on much of our publicity material um, when he was killed um, we had to get rid of this because it was uh, bad, I think, for children to be seen with something like that. Um, it, it wasn't a disaster for the company. He had actually uh, helped us for about four years. When Jim died uh, in 1968, uh, his parents gifted over 120 trophies and awards to Dunn's Town Council. Um, Dunn's was the um, administrative centre of Berwickshire. Uh, the county of Berwickshire. He was made a, a, a Burgess uh, of Duns in 1965, I think, and um, Duns celebrated his successes quite, quite often uh, during, during the 60s, so it seemed to be an obvious place for the trophies to come. Scalextric sought other means to attract sales, and the power sledge was introduced. Highly innovative, the chassis possessed exceptional stability, combined with considerably more power than the race-tuned series. Many sledges are still in use today. The Scalextrix Formula 3 racing team also competed very successfully at this time. Scalextrix introduced the team cars. Another new product was the 45 degree banked circuit. Intended to cater for the potent power sledges, it was difficult to assemble and clumsy to store. However, it was successful in sales terms. The following year was a recapitalizing period. 1969 was a lean year for new models. Excessive development spending in the previous two years meant that promotional budgets were reduced. U Steer was launched in 1970. A complex hand throttle featuring an additional steering wheel which altered the polarity of the current supplied to the motor. This allowed it to swerve in order to avoid special obstacles laid on the track surface. Additional extensions allowed the U-steer cars to creep over the edge of standard track sections. As the cars were so fast, it took very skillful hands to make it work properly. Unfortunately, it was unpopular and helped to speed up the company's relocation to Margate. The move to Margate was brought upon us by the problem of trade as a whole, that, that the volume had diminished by 1970 to the extent that the Havant factory was not fully occupied, and similarly the factory at Margate, which made trains, was also uh, not fully occupied. And it was therefore quite a logical idea to combine the two together, uh, because the, the Margate factory was the larger and had capacity to take on scale extric and there was a considerable similarity with the type of product, injection moulding, electric motors, um, electrical connectors, transformers. Um, <clears throat> one might argue that the two should have been put together in the first place, but I think if this had happened, Scalextric would never have evolved to the extent it did, where it had one company 100% behind it. This was a water colour which would have been presented to the board and they would have decided whether to use this either as a cover for one of the boxes or possibly in one of their catalogues.
Over the years, the Scalextric product has been represented as an art form on brochure covers and pages, on advertising banners and promotional material. Here are some examples of the artwork used. Since the introduction of Skelextric, it has attracted attention from young, acquisitive hands. In later years, the children mature and, as adults, have started to seriously collect the toys. We talk to Rod Moore of the Cumberland Toy and Model Museum, Alan Slade of the National Skelextric Collectors Club, and Richard Lines, former director of the Triang Group. Pre-1970 Skelextrics are of particular interest, and some are very highly desirable. Well, basically, these are cars that were on sale to the public, and I think the hardest to find is probably the blue Bugatti. Only about 600 of those were made. With conflicting figures being bandied about, a large question mark hangs over the actual numbers released. No, no one's really sure about that. Uh, we suspect that they were used as samples. Some have actually been played with that we know of that are still in existence. One or two have never really been used, and one I certainly know, uh, I think, belonged to a rep. 
The Cumberland Toy and Model Museum in Cockermouth, Cumbria, is a delightful playground for anybody remotely interested in toys, especially as many of the items in the museum's collection started life as toys belonging to Rod Moore and his family. As the museum curator, we wondered what Rod thought about the replicas and recently released copies of Rare Scale Extrix. No problem at all, providing that people do realise that they are replicas. Um, I would prefer, much prefer, to have something rather than nothing, especially as in my case, as you can see from the layout here, uh, I occasionally like to use them as well. But not only do I get pleasure from it, I want other people to get pleasure, hence opening the museum so that people can see just what I've accumulated over the last 30 years or so. The museum has a wonderful collection of toys and models, but even with such a substantial layout, does Scalextric have an important place in toy history? Well, as you can see, it's quite important. I specialise in Hornby trains and Scalextric, among other things. Alan Slade of the National Scale Extric Collectors Club is employed full-time in the mechatronics department of Loughborough University. In the second programme, we shall see the relevance of that department in future product and production techniques activities. We asked Alan the importance of the club in maintaining Scale Extric's image in the United Kingdom. The relevance of the club is the fact that we do have the potential of quite an influence on the way that Hornby Hobbies operate. Our buying potential probably is a bit small and some of the members do ask silly questions but if we put our act together properly we have quite a considerable influence on the way that Hornby can work. NSCC activities are varied but mainly restricted to entertaining the interested few. So how beneficial is this to Hornby Hobbies? National Scalectrics Collectors Club can be very important to a manufacturer if they prepare to work together in the fact of getting um, the parts from the cars, listening to what the customer, which is the collector club, says, and if the collector's club actually asks sensible things of the factory. That unfortunately, members tend not to ask a sensible thing. And if they went through a, a coordinator, and that's, I'm actually the coordinator for the factory with the collector's club, I can actually influence or exert quite a bit of influence with them. Unfortunately, being, what well, I can only say, a com vested commercial interest in people before, I've got absolutely no commercial interest and no bias my only bias is which I wish to see bigger and better Skeletrix products. The Skeletrix Collector Club can be very instrumental in getting new products from the factory. If they, like I say, if they actually put their act together and produce or are central things. I've actually developed one or two models for Hornby or made prototypes which I've sent down there and they actually are evaluating them at this very moment. So in a way it can be very beneficial. So with such an active following, what does Hornby Hobbies feel about the collectability of the product? Well, Scalectric has always been a very nice product. And I suppose it's not surprising that people will latch on to older models. Um, it's certainly very flattering when one hears that some of these change hands for hundreds of pounds, or even thousands I've heard of, uh, when, when you think that they were originally selling for 30 shillings or pound 50. But there is certainly an intrigue about them, and uh, collecting is something that most people do. And all boys are very acquisitive, and it seems that they, they grow up and they remain acquisitive. And uh, we welcome it. But there's nothing we can do to influence them, because it's history, and we have to be an ongoing commercial concern. With the move to Margate, the first stage of the Scalextric story came to an end. The range has grown from a few simple but effective clockwork models until eventually every year would see new and exciting models appearing in the January catalogue. A glossary of model production is therefore invaluable to any study of the subject.